Namaste and greetings. I'm Mahima Kapoor, researcher and assistant editor at IMPRI, Impact and Policy Research Institute, Prabhav Evam Niti Anusandhan Sansthan, Nai Delhi. Welcome you all to the IMPRI hashtag web policy talk. Today, we have gathered for a distinguished lecture on different views among the great powers about international order under the series, the state of international affairs, hashtag diplomacy dialogue. This talk is being organized by the IMPRI Center for International Relations and Strategic Studies and delivered by Professor Michael B. Yahuda. I'm honored to introduce the speaker for the session, Professor Michael B. Yahuda. Sir is a professor emeritus of international relations at the London School of Economics and Political Science, University of London, where he served from 1973 to 2003. Since then, he has been a visiting scholar at the Sigur Center for Asian Studies, the Elliott School, and the George Washington University. He has been a visiting research fellow at the Australian National University and a visiting professor at the University of Adelaide and the University of Michigan. He has also been a guest scholar and fellow at the Woodrow Wilson Center, Washington, DC, and the Fairbanks Center for East Asian Studies, Harvard. He was a visiting senior fellow at the Singaporean Institute for Southeast Asian Studies and at the Chinese Foreign Affairs University, Beijing. Sir has acted as an advisor to the British Foreign and Commonwealth Office and as a consultant to organizations in London and Singapore. His main fields of interest are China's politics, foreign policy, and the international relations of the Asia Pacific. He enjoys an international reputation as a specialist on the politics of East Asia. He has published 10 books and more than 200 articles and chapter in books. His latest book include the international politics of the Asia Pacific. He is awaiting the publication of a kind of autobiography called My Life as a Cosmopolitan. He is currently working on a book on the resurgence of Asia, an account of the last 5,000 years. It outlines achievements in Asia until the advent of the West and the rise and the relative decline of the West and the new re-emergence of Asia. We welcome you, sir. Thank you very much. Very we kind. Are Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, we are fortunate to have Professor Siddharth Malavarapu and Dr. Satoru Nagao as the discussants for the session. Professor Siddharth is a professor in the Department of International Relations and Governance Studies, School of Humanities and Social Sciences, Shivnadar University. Welcome, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Satoru is a fellow at Hudson Institute and senior research fellow at Japan Forum for Strategic Studies, Tokyo, Japan. We welcome you, sir. Thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you, sir. The deliberation is being moderated by Dr. Simin Hetta, CEO and editorial director at IMPRI. I invite Dr. Mehta to take the proceedings further, and we look forward to learning from our esteemed gathering. Thank you. Thank you, Mahima, and good evening to everyone from India, and uh, good morning to friends in the United States. So great powers have always been very prominent in international relations. Their rise and fall have often led to structural transformations of international relations. What is international order? Which bro it broadly refers to the international economic institutions, bilateral and regional security organizations, and political norms, and also their ordering mechanisms. This has become very articulate since the end of the Second World War and the emergence of uh, the United States and the Soviet Union as superpowers. The questions that arises is that whether these two countries and other two major powers that emerged after the end of the Cold War agree, reaffirm, and converge on the concept of international order. What does it take to build an inclusive and sustainable international order that would understand the existing international order 
assess the current challenges to that order and recommend the ways forward with respect to that order. So to discuss these questions and beyond, we are honored to be hosting this distinguished lecture by Professor Michael Yehuda, joining us from United States, along with an eminent panel of discussants, Professor Siddharth Malavarapu, my teacher, and Professor and Dr. Satoru Nagao, joining us from Tokyo, Japan. I extend my warm welcome to you all and to all the participants here on Zoom and on Facebook Live. I yield the floor to Professor Yehuda. Professor Yehuda, over to you. Well, thank you very much. Um, normally, when spe people speak of great powers, they look at it from a fair distance in the sense that they uh, regard the great powers as those that can shape the uh, character of international relations at any given point. But what I want to do now is to really uh, look at it from the other angle. That is to say, not looking above at how the great powers operate, but really looking from the perspective of the great powers themselves. What is it that uh, they think is the order that would favor them and, uh, and carry on from there? Now, the... Uh, uh, the traditional view of international order is that there are rules, international institutions, there's an international law, and norm-producing patterns of relating to each other in action. But um, if we turn it around a little bit and try and look at it from the perspective of the um, different great powers, we get a rather different picture. First of all, I should note that it's only the great powers that have views that are significant for international order as a whole, and not just for their narrow interests. And for our purposes, only India, China, Russia, and the United States qualify as great powers who think about global developments and act upon it. Uh, and then in the second tier, there's Japan and perhaps the European Union. So I'll start with the current Chinese, or rather the uh, Communist Party of China's view of international order. At present, it is a two-pronged reaction to the current order. The current order is seen in Beijing as favoring the United States. Consequently, the Chinese would prefer an order based on multilateralism as the first step. They, wouldn't, they regard the present one as largely created by the United States uh, that is now under challenge. Uh, the Chinese would prefer at least to start with, an order that is based on multilateralism as a first step. That would increase the space for eventually an international order that would lead to China's centrality. Relations would develop as partnerships more generally granting a larger role for less developed countries until a rejuvenated China could take the lead as suggested by its traditional view of itself as having received the mandate of heaven to rule all that is below heaven, at least as adjusted to suit modern conditions. The US would like to recast the post-World War II settlement in which all countries would follow an international order with the US as the leader. Much stress would be put on international law and international norms, which would invalidate many of China's maritime claims. So in that sense, there is a, um, a mixture of ideological and uh, realist uh, policies that divide China 
and the United States. Russia would like to see its role enhanced as when it was the Soviet Union. That would not necessarily require the restoration of the old borders, but it would require deference to Russian leadership by the former members of the Soviet Union. In other words, there would be a, uh, a kind of duopoly with the United States, but one that is joined by China and India. India still stands for the principles of non-alignment. It would prefer, in my view, partnerships rather than treaty-bound um, uh, alliances. India would then become a permanent member of the UN Security Council, perhaps together with Japan. The two would then replace Britain and France as former colonial powers in the United Nations Security Council, which reflected the uh, international conditions of the late 1940s. Um, finally, India would like a peaceable relationship with China. Um, then we could say that Japan could be included as a great power for the purposes of this argument about great powers. It is no longer bound by its previous position as embracing pacifism. Its economy is still sufficiently large to shape the regional and perhaps the global economies. Now that it is rebuilding the military forces, Japan is rapidly building its armed forces not only for its own defense, but also for Taiwan and more broadly for its region. The EU is divided. It's lacking in the capacity to defend itself without calling on the United States. But in certain respects, it's a major economic power that seeks to promote international law and a degree of security in the Asia Pacific. Now, um, let me uh, continue with a few more observations. Uh, we live at, at a time of transition. Um, and it's a transition that affects the domestic politics as well as the international politics of each of the countries I mentioned. Um, the United States, um, as much as it may, may proclaim its adherence to democracy, its own democracy is in great difficulties. Um, there is a putative, uh, I was going to say charismatic, perhaps that's the wrong word, but it's uh, got a populist leader uh, only that has taken over one of the major American parties, uh, namely the Republicans. And clearly he seeks to uh, stand for president at the next presidential elections. And um, what he will offer is uh, major changes to the structure of American politics. And it would be a challenge to the existing domestic American political system. Um, and in that sense, America is, uh, is rather unstable. Uh, that those who are seeking to hold power have very different views as to uh, how to exercise American power. Um, I might add that despite all the talk of China's rise, uh, America is still by far the most powerful country in, in the world. It stands atop uh, the um, 
power system of the of the different countries, um, and it is the major uh, economy in the world, and it certainly seeks to change the norms and behaviors of the international system. It proclaims the adherence to international law and democracy, even though if you were to examine both, you would find American leadership rather questionable. Uh, as far as uh, China is concerned, at the moment, it's also in a period of transition. Uh, superficially, it seems that the uh, Communist Party uh, runs everything and and it follows Trotsky's old claim that having a communist party system means not only having a, um, a communist central committee and from that a political bureau and from that a standing committee of the political bureau, but in fact a one-man leadership. And uh, like all one man leaderships, this one uh, seems on the surface very stable, but in fact it is not. Um, China uh, is not yet equivalent to the United States, and in my view, probably never will be. A, it's got this dem demographic challenge in which the, the proportion of the population who may, regard, who may be regarded as the working uh, sector of the economy has been diminishing over, continuously over these last four years. And all the signs indicate that the population as a whole is diminishing. Uh, in fact, for the last four years, uh, the number of deaths is now uh, increasing beyond the number of births. And given the fact that China has really been able to grow by having uh, lots of new people joining the workforce, uh, they're going to find that that is a fundamental structural change. And the signs so far are that the Chinese government is uh, struggling to adapt to that. And I'm sure uh, that you all are aware that its major property company is on the verge of uh, collapse and it depends very much as to how much the central government is prepared to um, finance the, uh, the, the problem of this major property company, Evergrande. In, in addition to which, uh, most of China's major companies, which are state-owned, are heavily in debt. And so there's a financial overlay that uh, again becomes part of the structural problems of China. Now, of course, it's entirely possible that uh, China would be able to struggle along despite these structural problems. But clearly, if the World Bank anticipates that China's growth is going to be around 3% a year, that is hardly sufficient growth to enable it to overcome uh, American leadership of of, the, of uh, the economy, let alone the politics of the world as it exists. So uh, China is faced with uh, many problems that only China can address. The outside world may try to influence China, but it has no power over China. Under Xi, Xi Jinping's leadership, China has uh, withdrawn more into itself 
and is seeking once again to be kind of self-reliance. At the same time, China enjoys its position as the leading country in international trade, despite its economic problems. Um, India um, also has very big domestic problems. Um, its current leader, Prime Minister Modi, is really engaged in what some people call the Hinduization of the country. That is, putting all the stress on Hindus, although you might argue that Hinduism is a religion, it's more than that. It's also a, a social system. It has its own uh, philosophical roots and uh, as well as religious ones. And as far as Modi is concerned, the others uh, have to adopt a more subordinate position. Now, how far the Modi uh, approach is sustainable is still doubtful. So, um, Japan has just uh, had a change of leadership and um, with each leader you find a different emphasis on um, how to uh, administer this vast country with its many differences, uh, with its many ethnic diversity, different religions and so on. And uh, I don't think seeking to impose uh, one of the ethnic religious groupings as uh, the only one of significance is uh, not likely to last. India is too big and too complex a country to have one system imposed upon it. And um, uh, so, uh, from that perspective, all the great powers have very deep problems within them, and that necessarily shapes their view of the world. America, by tradition, has um, sought to, uh, first of all, uh, view itself and, and want others to view it as this kind of beacon on the hill the kind of country that most other peoples uh, seek to replicate. At least that's the American view. And hence for them, apart from the power concerns, there's also a strong ideological aspect to it. It's, um, in fact, the current President Biden seeks to uh, engage the relationship with the Soviet Union, almost on an ideological basis. He uh, wants to encourage what he calls democracy throughout the world, but clearly America in itself is no longer the symbol of democracy in the world. It has to overcome the crisis looming, centering on um, Donald Trump. And uh, as long as that is there in the system, there is a sense of instability about the United States itself. Uh, Russia, again, has uh, instability within it. Its economy, in some ways, is a, a kind of third world economy in which it is based very much on the export of raw materials, and particularly gas and uh, oil. Uh, true, it does have uh, uh, still an industrial base, and its military in particular deals with advanced uh, technology. But as a country as a whole, one wouldn't say it's in a healthy condition. And um, 
Again, it has a one-man leader, and one-man leaders may look very stable, but in principle, unless there is a, a clear view of what the succession might be, uh, it's prone to be regarded as inherently uh, unstable. Now, uh, India too has got a big transition to take place. Nobody knows what the succession will be when uh, Modi is no longer the leader. Um, the, uh, I might say that the Indian domestic political scene, in which I don't claim expertise, is nevertheless uh, one of great diversity. Um, the different states, although may be equal in law, they are not equal in terms of the weight that they have within India as a whole. Um, I, for, for example, uh, there are the, there's the continual trouble with Kashmir, which goes to the heart of Indian identity, which also involves a deep-rooted difference with Pakistan. Um, so uh, India and at the moment has different currents that it can follow. Um, the kind of um, uh, Hindu Hinduization, perhaps, uh, I don't think is sustainable. Uh, you know, when you think that um, uh, that India has perhaps more, I, I don't know the figures offhand, but has certainly more Muslims than uh, Pakistan and more Muslims perhaps in the Middle East. So, um, of course, India is not allowed to be a member of the uh, Islamic grouping of countries, yet, um, and also India on the whole does not seek to play a role in relations between uh, Islamic countries, but it wants its voice to be heard. Um, which country have they not dealt with? Well, uh, uh, the EU, of course, is deeply divided amongst itself, even as it seeks to set the norms for the world as a whole by emphasizing the um, values that emerged at the end of the Second World War. Uh, but it also wants to stress on the less developing countries. And in that sense, it's a kind of competition with China as to who should be regarded as the leader in quotation marks, that is to say the most prominent uh, advocate of uh, uh, what used to be called third world or less developed interests. Um, so I think I've uh, exceeded by a few minutes my allotted time and I apologize for that. No, certainly not, sir. Thank you so much. Uh, you have touched upon uh, so many, uh, so many important points and the countries. So that really deems um, explanation. So thank you so much. I would invite Professor uh, Siddharth Malavaraku to share his remarks. And okay. also you could touch upon um, the, the sections which uh, maybe on India, especially which Professor Yehuda has uh, spoken and uh, respond to those as well. Yeah, thank you. At the outset, uh, my gratitude to the hosts, uh, Impri for having invited me on this occasion. Uh, I must begin with a small disclaimer. I've not had the luxury of reading this paper, but uh, my remarks are largely derived from what I've heard uh, just now from Professor Yahuda's talk. Uh, I must compliment uh, Professor Yahuda at the outset for an informed and thoughtful survey of uh, the divergences in the manner in which order is currently conceived uh, by the major powers of the day. Uh, I think there are challenges uh, which seem to, in a sense, face uh, different countries in the manner in which they respond to the world at large, uh, both in the present, but also uh, going ahead, uh, I think quite clearly 
Uh, it'll depend very much on how they respond to the specific challenges which Professor Yehuda just outlined uh, with regard to each of these countries. Um, I mean, to begin with, in terms of nomenclature, um, you know, I've never been very comfortable with the term great powers. Uh, my preference is maybe for the term major powers. But I understand uh, that in terms, in definitional terms, uh, I think great powers are understood as having uh, fairly fundamental uh, capabilities in terms of system shaping. Uh, and to, to that end, I think uh, while we think about the notion of material influence, while we think of the notion of influence in terms of ideas, um, influence in terms of shaping uh, existing political, social and economic arrangements, uh, not just in one specific country, but more broadly, um, I think they certainly have an important role. Um, and I think uh, what was interesting about uh, Professor Yahuda's perspective here was that he was trying to uh, reside within these countries and try to think about, you know, how does the world look like uh, from the perspective of these uh, independent major powers? Uh, how do they view the world? Uh, what are they seeing? What are the challenges uh, they're likely to face? Uh, and how are they likely to respond to this in the years to come? Um, I think I would sort of um, broadly, in a sense, concur with many of the, the points uh, which uh, Professor Yahuda just laid out. But I had specific questions for each of these countries, uh, which I hope uh, at some point uh, you know, could be addressed uh, in the remarks maybe Professor Yehuda makes later. Um, I think to begin with, of course, uh, I think China is interesting. Uh, nobody's going to miss the elephant in the room. Uh, it's a major power. Some would argue it's a revisionist power. Uh, it's intent on uh, you know, certainly uh, changing the status quo. Um, its preference for a multilateral order is something uh, I think Professor Yahuda has spelled out. And it, 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 it envisages or it looks at the present order as one which is really um, a residue of um, you know, uh, what the United States has created. And therefore, um, at some stage, uh, if there is an opportunity, it would like to, of course, construct an order in which uh, it's a central author in more, in more ways than one. Um, the question I had with regard to even multilateralism vis-a-vis uh, -vis China uh, is whether at some point, if China acquires a certain quantum of uh, economic, further economic strength uh, and perhaps even military strength, um, is it likely to change its perspective on multilateralism? Uh, will it at some point um, you know, uh, be intent on more fundamental changes in the order? Or is it likely to be really tinkering as it seems to do at this stage, largely with existing multilateral arrangements. Um, after all, if we do agree that the Bretton Woods institutions, for instance, are really a legacy of an earlier period in which uh, post-Second World War with the US and the ascendant, uh, these institutions came into existence. Um, will this sort of, will these institutions still be the fundamental site in which multilateral politics has played out or will there be a desire uh, perhaps to create uh, a fresh set of institutions uh, with a far more central role for China in determining not just the, the questions about composition and decision making, but uh, more fundamentally uh, to alter the texture uh, of how we transact business uh, internationally. Uh, that's just a thought uh, I wanted to sort of uh, uh, forefront initially when it came to China. Um, I, I do agree with the point of view that um, it, it, today it is, it is wrong to ascribe and any degree of equivalence today uh, when it comes to China and the United States. Uh, I think the challenges which were mentioned too in specific with regard to China, um, you know, in terms of the uh, continuing leadership, uh, as well as the, the challenge of changing demographics, um, uh, demographics which does not necessarily advantage China, but in some senses disadvantages it, um, is something which uh, not many would disagree with. Um, I think with regard to the United States, uh, it's interesting to again think about uh, this whole idea about to what extent uh, is a rule-based international order uh, and to what extent do liberal values um, still hold sway uh, in terms of how we can think about uh, the US structuring of the world system. Uh, quite clearly, um, I think in the Trump administration, um, there was clearly a, a retreat from some forms of multilateralism uh, it became far more inward looking. Uh, and I think Professor Yahuda's point about um, the fact that um, Trump or Trump's politics uh, at some plane is still around in some form or the other. Uh, it's not something which is ent entirely uh, disappeared from the scene. And as long as it is there, it still poses a challenge uh, 
uh, when it comes to American multilateralism or you know attempts at shaping elements uh, when it comes to thinking about how we how we do business uh, internationally uh, with regard to a whole range of uh, questions which uh, which concern all these countries. Uh, I think the the issue about uh, the former Soviet Union again. Uh, I think uh, many have recognized that there is an element uh, where um, there is a tendency for the economy to be skewed largely in terms of the two resources. I think uh, Professor Yahuda mentioned gas and oil, um, and there is a certain nostalgia about um, former influence uh, the Soviet Union perhaps at one point exercised uh, over large swaths of, uh, in the world, um, but. Uh, I think quite clearly, um, uh, Russia, uh, nobody would disagree, is faced with its own challenges of internal authoritarianism. Um, and uh, there is, of course, uh, the question of what it requires then to also uh, fare much better uh, in economic terms uh, to, to avoid the distortions of really depending only on these two resources, gas and oil. Um, I think coming to India, uh, India has its own share of ideological challenges. Uh, I think in terms of a broad stroke, uh, Professor Yahuda suggested that non-alignment is still the, the fundamental fulcrum, uh, which in a sense determines the manner in which uh, India likes to respond to the world. Uh, I do think that we are uh, now, uh, there is clearly an effort to constantly emphasize that uh, we should not be overly ideologically driven in some respects when we, uh, when we, when we in a sense, uh, play a certain role within the international system, but more fundamentally think about it uh, in terms of pragmatic uh, partnerships. Uh, there has traditionally been an aversion to alliances. Uh, this is an aversion to alliances, which goes back to the early years as well, uh, where um, we've always felt that alliances um, too tightly uh, reduce the room for maneuver uh, and too tightly structure uh, the possibilities which might otherwise have been open. Uh, and therefore, that uh, aversion to alliances appears to continue even today, uh, although we're very open uh, in some respects to strategic partnerships. Quite clearly, uh, I think India is acutely conscious of the fact that there are deep democratic deficits uh, when it comes to international organizations. Uh, I think the permanent membership of the uh, UN Security Council is something which has constantly been uh, a fairly important consideration for us for a country like India. Um, and I imagine, uh, as Mr. Yahuda pointed, for countries like Japan, uh, which also, in a sense, uh, you know, uh, need to be more fairly represented uh, in bodies like this. Um, one could think about, you know, uh, when you're thinking about uh, domestic politics and foreign policy, um, the question I had is, can we make a distinction here between uh, domestic politics uh, and the ideological shaping of domestic politics? and its actual influence when it comes to foreign policy. Uh, some would argue that India is uh, less didactic and more pragmatic in some sense, and that uh, I do concur with the broad point uh, Professor Yahuda spelled out a little while earlier, which is to say that for a country as complex and diverse as, as India, uh, there is really no choice. We're likely to veer, uh, veer around to the middle way. Um, and I think that's something which has been borne out more generally, um, if you look at the long trends in politics, uh, there is a preference for the middle path. Uh, there is a tendency uh, for politics uh, in eventually to coalesce around uh, a certain middle uh, path understanding of um, you know, how we can stand in relation to specific issues. Uh, and that's perhaps something which is likely to be the case uh, over time. Uh, but one will have to watch this carefully to see how that shapes up. Uh, with Japan, I think clearly the change is underway as well. Um, I think the point about uh, retreat from uh, some earlier traditions of pacifism, um, reconsidering the military forces and strengthening of the military forces, uh, the role of the economy uh, with potential, potentially, which still continues to have an impact, um, you know, which is not restricted only to Japan. Uh, I think these are elements which uh, quite clearly are present. Uh, the diversity question, I think, has been posed both in the context of Japan and India. And I do think that eventually um, ha we have to find ways in which um, we are able to, uh, to celebrate elements of that diversity and uh, you know, provide for a politics which uh, really celebrates that diversity uh, in order to, to focus on the things which really matter in foreign policy. Um, with regard to the European Union, uh, I think mention was made about uh, the fact that the European Union also is committed 
uh, to a rules-based international order. Uh, some would argue that the European Union in some respects uh, uh, is really, uh, really a site for dense legal institutionalism, uh, somewhat unprecedented in some respects. Uh, so it's interesting to think about this question when we're thinking about the question of order and conceptualizing order. Um, to what extent uh, do we, in a sense, bring forth arguments which place a certain premium on norms, on international law, um, on um, you know, the idea of international society, which Hedley Bull once referred to in, in his famous book, The Anarchical Society. Uh, to what extent can we think about these elements coexisting uh, with all the other elements we've just heard uh, a little while ago, uh, which Professor Yehuda mentioned uh, at some length? Uh, I have two questions, broad questions relating to transitions and ideology. One, of course, uh, if we go by power transition theory, uh, at least, um, you know, one strand of power transition theory would, would argue that there is inevitably likely to be a tension between status quo and revisionist powers. Um, so this is a question which is often uh, interested international relations scholars. Uh, if we think of uh, the United States in this case, as a, in, in this instance, as a status quo is power and China as a revisionist power, um, is it likely that um, it, 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 at some stage this might take the form of conflict, uh, of real conflict? Um, uh, of course, you could have uh, what Yun Fung Kong once called uh, in his book, um, uh, An Old War, where he looked at the idea of a classic overtake, where uh, I think the United Kingdom, the United States uh, overtook the United Kingdom uh, post Second World War. Uh, and there was a power transition which took place, uh, which did not necessarily ensue uh, in the form of conflict one normally envisages with regard to the tension between status quo and revisionist powers. But that's not the norm necessarily. Uh, so we don't really know uh, whether this conflict is going to be sublimated uh, through institutions, through uh, norms, through legal procedures, through a rule-based multilateral order, or at some point, is it going to uh, spill over uh, into um, you know, uh, forms of conflict which we, which we do not really think uh, are desirable. Um, I, I, and the final point also about ideology. Um, I think there are two dimensions here while looking at these countries and their perspective on order. Um, so to what extent do beliefs about oneself matter within the international system? To what extent are perceptions also linked to how others view us uh, from the outside? Um, and is there a meeting point between these two pictures? Uh, do, they, do they, in all these instances we've talked about, the United States, China, Russia, India, uh, the EU, perhaps uh, Japan, uh, in all these instances, it'd be interesting to think about um, to what extent is there a neat mapping of self-belief versus, uh, say, an image from the outside, uh, how others view you. Um, and in some cases, they may be congruence. In some cases, they may not be congruence uh, to the extent one would um, perhaps like to see internally from within these countries. Uh, so it'd be interesting to see uh, if Professor Yehuda has some thoughts on this particular question. I'd like to hear more about it. Um, and finally, I think when we come to thinking about order, uh, you know, in international relations thinking uh, quite clearly, at least you can have three or four very distinct pictures of viewing order. Uh, one, of course, is, uh, you know, standard realist lens, which places a far greater uh, emphasis on material power and standing uh, as really the determinants of order. And that's where uh, the influence of these major powers is critical. Uh, liberal institutionalists, of course, are likely to argue that there's certain autonomy institutions still enjoy in the international system, uh, notwithstanding the role of the major powers uh, to influence the manner in which uh, international politics plays out. And I think constructivists in the English school uh, uh, theorists would argue that norms matter, culture matters. Um, you can think about some notion of international society even today, uh, notwithstanding the various pulls and pressures. Uh, and it might be interesting to see if this uh, still holds sway uh, in the world we live in. I'll stop with that. Uh, thank you. I thought it was a very uh, rich and enjoyable uh, presentation of ideas relating to conceptions of order uh, from the perspective of all these countries. Absolutely. Thank you, sir. And you have really uh, enriched it further. Thank you so much. So I would invite uh, Dr. Satoru Nagao to share his remarks. Over to you, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, I learned a lot from uh, Professor uh, uh, It is honor for me to ask the uh, questions and uh, comment from now. Uh, instead of a uh, little long explanation, uh, I want to ask uh, Professor 
uh, eight questions. A lot of me, but uh, eight questions. Uh, first one, first one is uh, if China will not catch up the United States, which country is the real most serious competitor for the United States? Uh, this is a question uh, because uh, President Biden said the China is the most serious competitor. But uh, in your calculation, the China will not catch up the United States. So, but uh, last 246 years, uh, the US history, uh, United States uh, is competing with other great powers. And finally, they reach the number one, only one superpower in the world. So in the US society itself, uh, competition is a very vital part, I think. So indeed, uh, last 246 years is uh, US history. The uh, US spent uh, only the 169 years to change just the colony of the British Empire to the only one superpower in the world. And the last uh, 76 years, the US has kept their status. So view from this situation, the rival, a competitor is very important part of the US policy, I think. And uh, indeed, uh, I'm Japanese. That is the reason I feel this is very important because the uh, last 246 years, uh, all of the rivals has disappeared, including Germany, Japan, and the Soviet Union, indeed. So that's why uh, to set up the goal of the foreign policy, to set up the goal of the nation, uh, Indeed, the most serious competitor is very important part, I believe. Um, so in this case, uh, if China is not the most serious competitor, which country? It's a very important part to understand the US foreign policy, I believe. Uh, that is, I asked this question. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, I should not speak uh, too long. Uh, of course, uh, I like the United States, uh, but uh, at the same time, uh, I want to analyze the US foreign policy from this. Second question is uh, related with the uh, first question. If China arrive with uh, Russia, will it be the serious threat for the United States? That is second question. So China uh, is not a serious competitor, uh, but if China-Russia combination, situation is changed, I think. So in this case, what do you think sir, that is uh, uh, my question? Third question. If the United States is not the symbol of the democracy, which country will lead the democratic countries? Is uh, another question. This is this is a question related to the number one, number two, but at the same time, a little different uh, aspect. Because uh, Freedom House in the United States pointed out the free countries uh, are reducing. In 2005, 89 countries are free countries, but the 2020 uh, number has declined to the 82. So in the non-free countries, the, in, the, in the account, the, in 2005, the number of the non-free country is 45, but uh, 2020, this is 54, increased. So in, in their view, uh, democracy is under threat. So in this case, uh, I think uh, someone need to lead this one. In the most case, uh, remember, uh, US is the leading role uh, in the democratic world. And uh, now question four is related with uh, uh, question three, indeed. Uh, if the US need to recover uh, their leading role, what should the US do? Is uh, this is a, a little policy related uh, uh, policy recommendation? Uh, I want to hear. Uh, so. And uh, so, number five, question five <laughs> uh, uh, about the rule based order. Rule based order is a very important word, uh, especially when we talk about the security in the Indo Pacific. So, but uh, Rule-based order, in the rules-based order, who will decide the rule is very important. 
So in the future, who will decide the rules? Uh, especially in the Indo-Pacific. That is my question. Uh, will US uh, will read the Indo-Pacific or uh, more, de more different system will decide the rule? Maybe it's, um, uh, something like that. So. From number six, question number six to eight is uh, connected uh, because uh, more specific questions. If China invade Taiwan, will the US intervene is a uh, question six. And uh, why the seven and eight is connected with uh, question six? Because the different price. If China occupied all of the South China Sea, uh, will the US intervene is uh, another question. So not Taiwan, uh, but question six is Taiwan, question seven is South China Sea, and question eight is Indochina borders. If China invade India, in the Indochina border, will the US intervene is the third, uh, eight questions. So this is all of the eight questions. Uh, of course, uh, you can choose the uh, best question and answer it, uh, but uh, it is honor for me to ask this question. Thank you very much. Sir. Thank you, Dr. Satoru. You have raised very, very important questions indeed. So uh, yeah. it needs to be really uh, thought about. Thank you so much. So I would uh, ask Professor uh, Yehuda to respond to the uh, remarks and the questions that have been raised by Siddharth sir and uh, Dr. Satoru. Well, in the, in the time available, uh, I will not be able to uh, discuss all the issues that have been raised. Um, uh, there's a question of China as the elephant in the room, and indeed it is. I mean, it's one, one of the things that China and India have in common is that um, in the present world, um, neither can be invaded and occupied. Uh, so that that creates a problem of a balance between the two. Um, and, uh, and I think uh, one of the big questions that does need to be addressed is what kind of relationship uh, can India envisage uh, uh, in a pragmatic way uh, with China? Uh, obviously, there are sources of conflict, but there are also sources of uh, commonality. So um, I think that's one of the big unanswered questions that we face. Um, I see China as, uh, instead of having a projection in which it just gets more and more successful, I think China is facing uh, a problem of, um, of, of enormous proportions in regard to its own domestic issues. And... Um, it has to address those as well as foreign affairs. Now, some people say that uh, foreign affairs is used to um, focus its nationalistic people on, uh, on the unity of China. Now, that may be possible, but I think there, there are uh, various difficulties along the way for that. Um, the, um, then there, both uh, questioners have uh, touched on uh, demographics and um, uh, clearly demographic change is not at the moment in favor of China. Um, the Western world is also facing that issue, but the Western world is better equipped to deal with um, 
decline of uh, population numbers, then perhaps a less developed country, certainly a huge country such as China. Uh, India faces a demographic problem, but in a different way, in the sense that, that its population is not declining, it's continuing to rise. And as a uh, primarily a, a poor uh, country, India, India requires very much uh, assistance from the outside world. Um, and uh, in some ways, uh, that assistance is, is there. I mean, Japan is one of the major uh, contributors to investment in India. Um, but the transition um, is never, was never easy. Um, there was a question of the idea of uh, how one or how countries uh, believe in their identities and act upon it and uh, the extent to which uh, others really see it that way and see it, it in the context of order. Now, uh, uh, we live very much in a world that is moved by nationalism and um, nationalism does not, well, raises the issue of self-belief in a rather different way. Uh, in a sense, it's not necessarily uh, one that is based on, um, on agreement between different interests and, and different outlooks. Nationalism seeks to override all of those. And um, uh, that in itself uh, opens the door to other, other issues. Uh, we saw how Europe in a not so distant past tore itself apart on questions of nationalism. That's un unlikely, and there's one issue we haven't really talked about, and that is the nuclear one. To what extent is, are those possessing nuclear power also constrained uh, by not being able to use it? Um, and that also includes North Korea. And it's one thing to be able to threaten and to uh, uh, shout into a microphone, but it's another to risk using uh, nuclear weapons because any country that the North could, um, could attack uh, is one that could respond even more strongly. So, um, uh, but nevertheless, the nuclear cloud has not disappeared. Um, now, to refer to some of the eight questions that were raised. Um, well, China is already trying to change the international institutions and the norms of international society to use that uh, old term from the so-called English school. Um, but um, the, if the UN can, is taken over in some ways by China, by Chinese concerns, then the issues that the UN addresses will still be there. And if the UN can't handle them, uh, in a way that the UN was stymied for a long time because of the Cold War between uh, Russia and the United States, that is still possible involving the United States and China. Uh, um, that, how far does that change the world? Well, it creates a new irritant, but whether it really changes the world, um, the issue would be um, for example, how to bridge the gap between the less developed and the developed countries, which is supposedly uh, a core issue for China. Well, I'm not sure that China has really 
address that question properly. What China has addressed are Chinese interests that maybe are packaged in different ways in different contexts. But as far as the future for China as seen by Xi Jinping and his supporters is that China will end up as um, the bearer of the mandate of heaven in the current era. But I don't think that that is likely because it's so China is so self-centered uh, it, that it has offended not only its neighbors but most of the countries in the world that are not dependent on China in one form or another. So in that sense China can be uh, a disruptor but whether it can provide construction I doubt very much. So uh, China can influence the rules, but it cannot decide them. Um, as I try to argue, all the, uh, all the countries in a way have got used to depending on the United States, but it is the United States now that is in deep trouble uh, between the Trumpists and the, Dem and the democratic elements that still remain there and the law. Um, so it's finding a, a deficit of trust, I think is the term, uh, that is used uh, by indeed many of the countries that actually do depend for their survival on the, Uni on the United States. So um, I'm not sure that we really have an order at the moment. We have elements of order in the sense that um, uh, it seems very unlikely that nuclear weapons can be used, but nevertheless, we can't rule it out. Um, a crisis could escalate and move beyond the control of a so-called rational decision maker. Um, so we can't rule out nuclear weapons. Uh, we can't really uh, agree that there are rules that um, concern the um, production, let alone the deployment of nuclear weapons. So I, although people don't talk about that very much, I think it's still an overriding issue. Um, do the Israelis have nuclear weapons? Well, most people seem to think that they do they are not included in the normal discussions between nuclear powers. And there are signs that others in the Middle East feel that they must have nuclear capacities too. So um, these are old questions that go back to an earlier period regarding the proliferation, but nevertheless, it hasn't gone away. Now, uh, a question was raised about one's own sense of identity or self-belief and how that affects external relations are ultimately also views of international order by others and where does this sense of identity fit into that well one could argue that there is a um, an element of uh, conflict in the international society and I use the word advisedly because that presumes that they have that the society involves more than just relationships of power but involves uh, agreements about diplomacy and, and various other forms of um, resolving conflicts. Um, so um, there are some practical questions about China allied with Russia and where the United States will be. Well, um, China, neither China nor Russia look upon each other as real allies. They look at um, each other as partners. After all, uh, one of the major uh, sources of arms for India 
and others is Russia. And so here is India notionally in conflict with China and there is Russia arming its adversary. Now that doesn't suggest to me uh, the way allies behave. Um, and then does it really matter how we count up the number of democracies and number of uh, non-democracies? Um, I know there are uh, many people who like to uh, think in terms of numbers, but um, how many of these 40 so-called democracies are, are, really de are really democracies? Who knows? And do the non-democracies have uh, uh, some kind of elements of democracy within them or aspirations to democracy within them? Who knows? Um, now, uh, the basic question, I suppose, is who decides the rules of this uh, international order, if there is one? Uh, I would suggest at present, uh, no one decides the rules. I know mean, uh, there is the um, residue of the rules as existed uh, a few decades ago. <clears throat> In fact, one could argue that the, one of the distinctions of the Cold War is that both protagonists operated within a number of informal rules. But today, that is not the case. I mean, China is seeking to uh, change international institutions in its favor. Um, I'm not sure America has yet fully addressed this, but um, it, it is an issue in which the uh, Chinese are certainly saying that they're not follow, following rules but, but, or the, uh, because the Americans uh, have imposed them and they serve American interests. And that in effect, they keep us down. So um, I'm not sure we have real rules. We have um, uh, some elements of rules uh, in the sense of, uh, you know, there's the universal union of postal services. There's uh, rules about flying, um, passenger and cargo aeroplanes. Uh, there are rules about uh, how ships deal with, are dealt with in foreign ports and all sorts of things. But these are really facilitators of economic exchanges. Uh, but in terms of power, I think we are really in this question of transition um, that Professor Siddharth mentioned. Um, I don't think it's necessarily involves the um, uh, kind of conflict that um, the great Athenian historian uh, uh, suggested. Uh, he, he suggested that the origins of the war are, was in Greece was because um, Athens could not accept the growth of Sparta and therefore war was inevitable. But I don't think that applies. Uh, these are two heavily nuclear armed or three heavily nuclear armed countries. How can they go to war? They can have skirmishes. They can have even battles. They can uh, have proxy wars. But how can these two really go to war? Or these three really go to war? I don't see it. But I'll stop there. Right. Thank you, Professor. Thank you for uh, responding to those questions uh, so patiently and definitely adding uh, to the to the discourses. So thank you so much. Um, so going ahead, uh, we have uh, some 
time left for um, questions uh, from the audience. And uh, I would like to uh, give Professor Yehuda some rest and uh, ask Professor Siddharth um, one question from Dr. Bamdev Sigdal. He asks, um, rather, he, it's his comment, and if you could answer, respond to that. I think aid diplomacy has failed and thus emerging countries like India should come up with more investment and trade activities so as to enhance cooperation with its uh, with countries of South Asia as well as other developing countries uh, instead of joining in groupings. So would you like to take it from uh, take this question? Uh, he this is a question sure. from Dr. Sigdal from Nepal. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Sigdal, for that question. Um, I've also briefly responded in the chat box uh, already. Uh, but uh, just to reiterate the point, uh, I think there is a classic assumption that uh, if you increase economic inter interdependence between countries, uh, that it might actually diminish conflict. Um, and that's the hope very often, especially when it comes to uh, recourse to trade um, and the, uh, the desire to sort of recognize that uh, it creates dependencies also among people uh, and the scope, therefore, uh, there is a there's a sense of mutual interest, uh, which sometimes might uh, actually act as a positive good uh, to avoid or diminish the possibility of conflict. Um, of course, I think uh, while thinking about um, groupings, um, I think clearly India has been quite uh, wary of alliances uh, because they tend to be uh, rather formal, uh, they, they tend to, in a sense, uh, as India sees it, limit choices rather than enhance choices. Uh, and therefore, I think there is a temptation sometimes to take recourse to partnerships, strategic partnerships as well, but not necessarily uh, alliances in the classic sense of alliances. Uh, and I think that's likely to continue. I don't see that changing uh, immediately uh, at all in terms of uh, how, how India then goes on to do that. Uh, but I think there is, of course, possibility for, I think, um, far greater work, even in terms of, uh, you know, the attractiveness of, uh, as an investment destination, for instance, um, you know, the economic attractiveness elements to be built within the country as well. Uh, I think there, there are, there is talk of bureaucratic reforms very often uh, in order to enable greater investments even within the country um, and to have to use some of that economic uh, growth eventually uh, to also enter into new, um, you know, trade alliances and relation, trade relationships or economic partnerships with other countries. Uh, I think that that hopefully should flow from the fact that there is uh, a fair amount of domestic strength uh, felt uh, to be able to do that. Um, and I think this will depend ultimately on how uh, all of this plays out. Thank you. Uh, thank you, sir. Professor, uh, I would just like to uh, ask a follow-up question uh, to that. Um, you know, um, you taught us about great power uh, rivalry as a major theme or a major challenge or problem in uh, international relations and in global politics. So, but in all this, where does larger questions of uh, combating climate change or for that matter, even addressing uh, uh, radical terrorism and uh, where do these appear to be solved uh, in, in this? Yeah, I think I was going to save that for my last few remarks on the way forward, suggesting that, you know, that ultimately, I think the real challenge is going to be global leadership. Uh, and there is a crisis uh, of global leadership, I, whichever way you look at it. Um, and of course, I think one of the questions we often ask is, you know, how can we, uh, you know, uh, contribute to global public good, uh, things like clean air and water, uh, fresh water and things like that, but also the avoidance of global public bads like terrorism, for instance. Uh, and here again, um, quite clearly, we haven't fared as well as we should have fared, for instance, on the climate change question globally. Uh, or if you think about, you know, a whole range of other questions where norm building is essential. Uh, I think that there will be pressures in some areas uh, to create arrangements which uh, are in the interests of most countries. Um, but it would depend also ultimately on leadership. Uh, and given the, I mean, as liberal institutionalists would argue that somebody should be willing to foot at least a part of the bill uh, and the transaction costs of setting up these arrangements sometimes, uh, you know, involve uh, in leadership initiatives of particular countries. And in the past, this has clearly rested with the United States in many ways. Uh, 
but as Professor Yahuda mentioned, uh, I think there's there seems to be some reluctance, uh, at least clearly in the Trump years, there was enormous reluctance uh, and there was a pullback. Uh, and we'll have to see to what extent uh, the US can continue to do this role, uh, at least uh, perhaps not uh, in the manner in which it was doing earlier, but even if it can uh, further you know, strengthen elements of multilateralism uh, within the international order. I feel multilateralism is our best bet ultimately uh, if we have to solve these global problems. Yeah, that's true, sir. Thank you so much. So, uh, Professor Dr. Satoru, uh, I would like to rest, uh, to ask this question as a matter of curiosity, as well as your uh, thoughts on on the AUKUS. You know, uh, Professor Yahuda mentioned about nuclearization and uh, the nuclear power tussle. So. It did come as a surprise, right? The announcement of AUKUS right before the Quad Summit was going to be held in the in the United States in person summit. So it appears to have dwarfed the Quad structure. So is it, you know, a Japan? A Japanese perspective on uh, whether you see it as um, again a reinforcement of the white Anglo or colonial power structure in terms of AUKUS uh, and also fostering or leading to a nuclear power tussle in the Indo-Pacific. Thank you very much for asking, Mitch. Uh, in Japanese, view, AUKUS is welcome and uh, Quad is also welcome. Because uh, we believe uh, international security system, especially in the Indo-Pacific, has changed from hub and spoke to network base. How different? Hub and spoke is based on the bilateral treaty-based alliance between US and Japan, US and Australia, US and Philippines, US and Thailand, US and US and US and the all of these are bilateral treaty-based alliance. So in this case, this hub and spoke system heavily depending on the US because the US got all of the information and all of the allies of the uh, United States depend on the United States. So this is hub and spoke, but uh, this system uh, hasn't uh, worked well to deter the China's uh, territorial expansion. That is the reason the network-based system has emerged. How different is, uh, in this case, in the hub and spoke system, Japan and Australia, both are US allies, but do not cooperate each other so deeply. Because uh, they are allies of the United States, but the, Japan and Australia is not formal treaty-based ally. So, but in the network-based system, each allies cooperate each other and share the burden of the United States. This is network based. Sometimes we can find the trilateral cooperation of the Japan, Australia, India. This cooperation do not include the United States. Even if the US hasn't a part of it, US say this is welcome because this is part of network based system. What is AUKUS? What is QUAD? QUAD is important part of this system. QUAD is a group, strategic cooperation because this group includes all great powers in the Indo-Pacific except China. So this group is very powerful, but at the same time, AUKUS is also welcome. AUKUS is based on traditional uh, alliance, but just now as a network-based system, British and Australia cooperate each other because US, Australia, US, British, this is uh, uh, in the Indo-Pacific, this uh, traditional cooperation, but now trilateral cooperation. To build the network-based system, these are part of it. And uh, at the same time, at the same time, for a long time, this kind of trilateral-based uh, 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 cooperation uh, as a part of the network-based security system hasn't achieved to fix something. They talk each other, they hold the joint exercise, that's all. But this time, AUKUS achieved. They start to start joint arms development project, nuclear submarine. So in this case, this is one of the good example uh, other trilateral cooperation can imitate. So other trilateral cooperation should start similar one, uh, what at least they try to do. So as a part of the network-based system, both AUKUS and QUAD are important. 
and other trilateral, other quadrilateral, or other bilateral cooperation is also important. This is a new type of the security system. So some people say, because of the AUKUS, we do not need the quad. That's not true. True thing is, both are part of the big security system. That's my answer. Thank you. Sure, sure. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Sato. So I'll uh, just move on to uh, Professor Yehuda. Professor, um, uh, you know, um, there are, I'll, I'll take a few questions also from, uh, from the audience where one question is very important, according to me, uh, is by Dania Roshan, who asks, um, how far women leadership can change the current political situation of the world? And uh, tie it with my own question about populist leadership that you mentioned. Uh, isn't it also true that such a nature of leadership in whatever form that has existed and continues to exist uh, has much contributed to the uh, image of that respective country uh, as a major power. Um, we, we are seeing that in India as well. So if you could uh, respond to that and also uh, the question on women in leadership, sir. Well, um, the extent to which uh, the record of women leaders go, I think is very similar to men. Um, I mean, the, you know, if you think of your country, uh, you had um, Indira Gandhi, and she introduced the form of martial law at one point. Um, she looked at power in the same way as uh, uh, male leaders in India have, or, or perhaps she has been uh, the most male <laughs> of uh, Indian leaders. Um, in Britain, uh, Margaret Thatcher, is hardly can hardly be regarded as uh, uh, typical or what uh, women like to think of as typical of female behavior. And then in Sri Lanka, just next door to you, there are two ladies who are uh, quite nasty to each other and to, to the supporters of the other. So um, although Obviously, there's a, a, a greater place for, uh, fem for feminine roles in many countries. I'm not sure that it really makes that much of a difference in international relations. Um, the uh, foreign policies of countries are made up of all sorts of different elements. Uh, gender may be an issue, but it's not a major issue. I think at the moment, uh, when uh, there's such big change from uh, in, in highly developed countries, from uh, manual labor to, um, uh, to machinery, sets of machinery now, in the United States, you could argue that uh, all those who used to do manual labor between the ages of say 20 and 40 um, are not interested in, do, in uh, doing, if you like, caring jobs. I mean, there are some male nurses, there are some male uh, teachers, but as an overall proportion, they're very small. And uh, that means that there are uh, a large number of uh, semi-educated people between the ages of 20 and 40 who feel very resentful of, of what's happening and, and, and change. So uh, not all is positive from the sense of, uh, of, of modernity in, in the country's concern. Um, this is going to have effects in uh, India as well. I mean, India is, uh, hasn't reached that point. But nevertheless, uh, the fact that machinery is replacing uh, human labor 
as is cheaper for the uh, for the investors, and that's going to have its impact in one form or another in India as well. But I'd like to make another point. The issue of climate change was raised, I think, by um, by Professor Sidhari. Is that the right pronunciation? And here we must note a real structural problem in international relations. Who represents global interests? Who speaks on behalf of global interests? All the institutions we have, international institutions, are ultimately based on states. Even those who speak for the United Nations are speaking for states. Now, uh, there's no institution recognized as such by the world as a whole that says, look, we have a responsibility to the next generations apart from ourselves to uh, deal with climate change. It's a global issue. Yeah, we don't have the structures really to deal with it. We only we rely very much on the leaders of the very big countries who influence climate change. This includes China, the United States, India, and so on. Each one has its own interests. Each one has its own perspectives. Now, if they can agree, that's very nice. But um, we don't really have global institutions. And that's a real structural problem. Uh, um, we have, uh, especially amongst the young, many who are pressing on uh, climate change. Um, the United States even has a, an ambassador designated to deal with climate change. But he's seen, all, wherever he goes, he's seen first as an American, not as a global character. And that's a dilemma in a way that we all face. And we can't just look for leaders of nations to deal with this. This requires a, a change in the outlook. Now, you may people may think this is very, very unlikely. But if we were to think, as the professor mentioned earlier, about personal relationships, these are already in many regards, global relationships. I mean, uh, in the countries I know best uh, are Israel, um, Britain, and the United States. And in all of them, you'll find uh, peoples of various nationalities who are getting married, who are producing children, who are want who want uh, it education of a particular kind and so on. So at the lower level in society, there are people who in their daily lives want to have more interchange with others. But that's, that's not the level that counts at the moment because climate change is happening all around us. We're not, it's not just something for our children to worry about. And we don't really have the proper institutional mechanisms to deal with it. Great. Thank you, sir. So uh, we'll now move to the end of the session, amazing uh, session, I must say, uh, the way forward round. And uh, where do you see, um, this is a broad question which I would request uh, each of you to respond to uh, in, briefly in a minute or so, as to what are your views uh, going ahead about the great powers and the international order or even global interests, which Professor Yehuda has just raised. So I would start with uh, Dr. Satoru. Over to you, sir. Briefly, uh, in, a, in a minute. Uh, because of the, because of the uh, Americans' failure with the withdrawal from Afghanistan and the quad takeover uh, just after the NATO troops uh, uh, with or from Afghanistan, the U.S. leadership is uh, under threat. But this is just an image. In the long run, uh, maybe U.S. will recover this image, I believe. 
So that is the reason the US side country, uh, Japan is a former ally, of course, but uh, India is a great partner for the United States and Australia is also a ally. So this quad will, will be the very important uh, and uh, takes a role to decide international rule, I believe. So that is a reason uh, we are under threat, but uh, we will have the great, uh, great future. Uh, and uh, in this case, India's role is very important. So that is the reason we are, we are looking forward to see the bright future of the India. That is my opinion. Thank you. Thank you for that uh, bright note of optimism. Thank you, sir. So, uh, Professor Siddharth, over to you. Uh, thank you. I think uh, crystal ball gazing into the future in the best of times is fraught with huge problems. Uh, it's very hard to tell uh, what it's going to look like in, in the future. But I think uh, Professor Yahuda in his talk outlined, I think, some fairly important challenges for all the countries. And it will ultimately depend on how they address those challenges. Uh, I think uh, uh, with India, for us, it's finding the, the right middle path. Uh, I think China, uh, there are internal contradictions between you know, political monopoly and economic competition. Uh, some comparative politics theorists believe that that's likely to unravel at some point. Uh, we don't know if that's true, but uh, you know, we, we, we'll have to wait and watch. Um, with the United States, quite clearly, it's about reining in, um, you know, elements which uh, turn their back on multilateralism and, you know, uh, more positive forms of internationalism. Uh, and that's not necessarily a good thing for, uh, for the world, too, at some level. Uh, and so I think it will depend ultimately on also the quality of global leadership, um, which, is, uh, which is going to determine ultimately the manner in which we approach these questions. Uh, and I, I do believe that we will have to navigate an imperfect world uh, and we'll have to make the best of an imperfect world. Uh, but if politics is the art of the possible, uh, we have to find solutions to the problems we face globally and not just nationally. True, absolutely, sir. Thank you. Uh, Professor Yehuda, over to you. Your concluding thoughts. Well, uh, uh, looking ahead is uh, very difficult because if we don't really know the immediate past, uh, then um, we may face problems uh, that looking back on them we can say oh yes this was obvious and so on but at the time it isn't and uh, we are at one of these times in which uh, a whole number of contradictions which are mutually related are pressing down on us and um, if um, I, I said we don't have proper global institutions well, uh, we haven't really got uh, international institutions dealing with a problem that is emerging everywhere, and that is uh, the older generation. Um, it affects every country, but not always in the same way, but nevertheless, there's that. So I would suggest that one of the problems we have in looking at the future is a, a number of very, very large uh, issues that transcend the particular selfish interests of particular countries. Um, then as far as uh, countries are concerned, um, I think that opportunities exist for those who favor international society to, to operate. I say those who favor it rather than just democracies, uh, because I think that there's no democratic system that um, we can say, oh, well, that's, that's working extremely well. We should all be like that. Uh, I don't think we can find such a system in the world today. Um, this doesn't mean to say that democracy is not a, uh, very powerful, uh, well, I was going to say ideology, it's more than ideology, but uh, democracy is clearly a very, very central idea in discussions of politics, um, even in countries which are not democratic. Um, in China, for example, which would seem to be the 
a prime example of authoritarian uh, leadership and uh, organization and so on. There are many, many different interests. Uh, if you speak to intellectuals in China, you'll find that their ideas uh, are different, differ from each other, never mind differing from people like me. And uh, so there is a case for optimism, but, um, uh, but it requires, if we like, it requires us to move away from populism. I think populism is, is attractive in many countries and it's a real danger to the countries themselves. And, <clears throat> and the outside world can't really intervene in the domestic affairs successfully. So you know, it's a question of how you balance uh, the, the depth of the problems we face with the opportunities we also have. Um, when, when I was a boy, the world was very, very different. It was just recovering from the first world, from the second world war. And um, England was a very drab place. And most of Europe was too. Uh, um, yet people think of Europe as the sort of the heart of democracy. It, it wasn't so. Uh, perhaps one of the major contributions that the United States has made that is not generally acknowledged, that it didn't seek to get revenge from those that their soldiers fought against. On the contrary, amongst the richest countries now are Japan and Germany. And uh, that was only possible because of the United States. I can't think of another empire, if you like, <laughs> that uh, uh, treated uh, its adversaries who had gone to war, uh, treated it in the same way. And Russia, which has suffered much more than perhaps than any other country, just wanted reparations. Um, wanted them from Germany, wanted them from here and there. Um, the United States is not, was not a, a knight in shining armor by any means, but nevertheless, what it did for Germany and for Japan has made a real difference, not just to them, but to all of us. And if that can happen, then who knows what else can happen? So uh, there are grounds for optimism, although we tend to deal all the time with problems. I open a newspaper. Where do you find nice, happy <laughs> developments? You know, they always focus on the problems. And uh, whereas in our normal life, daily life, we know there are problems, but we also know that there are grounds for hope. And I think that's true internationally. Thank you. Thank you, sir. What a beautiful way to end this uh, wonderful discussion. Yes. Um, so I would now uh, conclude by formally uh, proposing the vote of thanks. Actually, thank you so much, uh, Professor Yehuda, for sparing your time and for this wonderful and wonderful distinguished lecture on different powers among the great, uh, different views among the great powers about the international order. Um, for the State of International Affairs Hashtag Diplomacy Dialogue series uh, under the auspices of the IMPRI Center for International Relations and Strategic Studies. And I would also like to thank uh, Professor Siddharth Malavarapu and also Dr. Satoru Nagao. Um, actually, you have been so, uh, so patiently, you have responded, you have taken the questions and also responded to, to them 
uh, you have actually added to the uh, practice, the literature, and also the theory of international relations for the times to come. I mean, it has been so personally enriching. I'm sure all those who have watched and those who would be watching us later um, uh, would, would uh, concur to that. And thank you all for uh, making this, uh, making a very rich contribution to the study of international relations. We are really deeply uh, humbled and honored to have had this discussion. Thank you so much, Professor Yehuda, Professor Malavarapu, and Dr. S uh, Nagao. Thank you so much. And thank you to all those who are watching us here on Facebook Live and on Zoom, and also those who would be listening to our podcasts and watching us on YouTube later. Thank you, and I wish you all a very good day ahead. Thank,